Terminator, which we made in 83, and it was released in 84, you know, everybody thought of that as kind of a low-budget movie, which it was. It was $6.5 million, and it took 11 weeks to shoot, okay? So when I made the movie, the, I, I made a movie called uh, uh, Grindhouse for Robert Rodriguez. And it kind of inspired me to go out and make my own Grindhouse movie, which was very cheap. And uh, I wrote it in three weeks. And I did all the pre-production. Pre Jennifer actually kind of was instrumental in making it happen. She found some, some money. She found uh, some material, uh, which was kind of like a saw, kind of like a saw rip-off kind of movie and that I rewrote in three weeks and um, we did all the casting and we did the wardrobe, we dealt with the Screen Actors Guild, we dealt, dealt with all the locations, we dealt with all the makeup, hair crewing up as they call it and um, we did that. Th during that three weeks that I was writing the script, 
we were doing all that. Most of the time, usually when you do pre-production, you have a script. And then you go around and you follow and you say, okay, for this scene, we're going to need this, and for this scene. We did this. We did the, I wrote the script and we did pre-production at the same time, in three weeks. And then we shot it in 12 days. Okay? And instead of like the Terminator, which is a low budget movie, it was 12 weeks. And uh, so we shot it in 12 days. And uh, uh, it was, uh, I made it because I wanted to do an exploitation movie. And uh, I wanted to do it real cheap. And uh, I wanted to be the person who made the difference between working on a big movie that like, or a big television series like Jen's talking about is that, and the ones that we're doing, is that we're in charge of these. We decide which movies we want to make. Uh, we write them ourselves. We cast them ourselves. And we shoot them ourselves. And we distribute them. We decide who's going to distribute them. And we make all the decisions ourselves. When we're on a big, big show or on a big television series, we're only responsible for our character. And a lot of times I'll be doing a television series and I'll want to change, you know, something in the, that doesn't make any sense. And it's always a big problem to change something because, you know, the showrunner on a television series has got to check with the producer, he's got to check with the head of the network, and it's like, you know, even though it doesn't make any sense to tell you to say it anyway, you know. So uh, we get all the uh, uh, control, production control and financial control, and uh, uh, most importantly, all the creative control in the small movies. Thank you. Yeah. We'll be taking questions from the audience. So if you have a question, please. Yeah. You already mentioned the, term, the Terminator, uh, with working with James Cameron, but there were also a lot of production problems during making The Abyss. Can you tell something about working on The Abyss? I mean, I don't really think that there were, uh, from my memory, there weren't a lot of production problems when we made The Abyss. Uh, it did not run over schedule. Uh, I think that uh, there were some actors on the show. Uh, I don't think it's any secret that uh, Ed Harris was not particularly happy with a couple of positions uh, that he was put in underwater that he felt were maybe were not safe. Uh, and I think that there were a few actors that were uh, disgruntled about having to spend so much time, like Jennifer was talking about. I, basically, that was 16 week shoot. My character, if you just shot my character and you wanted to shoot my character and get him out, you know, like if I was... If we uh, were shooting him, <laughs> it would be like <laughs> four days. <laughs> but, he, if, you know, um, I was there for, you know, 16 weeks, but if you really just wanted to shoot me, and if I was like Brad Pitt, and it was like coming in, we're going to get Brad Pitt, and we're going to get him, shoot him, shoot him out, get him out. Could have shot me out in a week, probably, on that movie, or 10 days maybe. But I was there for 16 weeks. So there was a lot of waiting around, but I don't think there were a lot of production problems. Uh, they didn't go over budget, and uh, I always talk about, you know, Jim, and uh, he is uh, very, very passionate. But to give you an example of how hard he works, there is, uh, we were working underwater, and we were working at uh, 30 feet. And so we would stay down a few hours, and so we could come straight up. But he would be underwater so long that he couldn't come straight up after the day is over because he would get the bends. So he would have to do what they call hang off the line. And he'd have to hang off the line and he'd come up 10 feet, wait a while, come up another 10 feet, wait a while, come up another. So one day, I was like exhausted. I put in like 12 hours, 14 hours, or whatever, and I was exhausted. And they had a window in the uh, set and you could watch the shooting going on and stuff. And I was watching Jim after I was done. I was tired. It was a long day. And I was leaving 
and I was walking by this window, and I saw Jim, and Jim was called doing what they called hanging off the line. Okay, so he was waiting, so his body could act, act, acclimate itself. And he wore a helmet so he could talk to us underwater, but he didn't have the equipment that we had, so it hurt his shoulders a lot, this, this helmet that he wore. So he was hanging upside down, and he was watching, he had this, this thing in front of him. It turned out he was watching dailies <laughs> you know, from the day before, you know. He was watching what he had shot the day before underwater, hanging <laughs> off the line, you know, after we had shot at the end of the day. So, you know, when you work with somebody who has that much, you know, passion and somebody who works that hard, uh, for me, it's, it's, you know, I, I would, I always said uh, that Robert Rodriguez, uh, that he uh, inspired me to make the Grindhouse movie, but that I would take a bullet for Jim Cameron. So, that's how I feel about Jim Cameron. Yeah. As uh, producers, what are you looking for in a script to make a, a good movie? She's the producer, actually. She's like, we have this com company, which is Block Bean Productions, and I basically am... He's basically yes, no, yes, no, no, yes. Yeah, she does all the work. <laughs> <laughs> no, that's not 100% true, but um, I do a lot of work. Um, you know, it depends. I mean, the genre, for, for the kind of movies we're making and for small, uh, independent films, um, the horror genre, the sci-fi genre, the um, grindhouse style, I'm sorry, ghost, ghost uh, thriller, uh, scientific uh, equations that, that thrill you, you know, or that are, you know, mysterious. Um, the genre, you know, genre pieces that are a little off -beat, not romantic comedy necessarily. Um, for what we're doing now, you know, I mean, uh, this is, it's a specific model. It's a, it's a um, small, independent model that, um, it's a very popular theme for some reason. The fans are very strong, and I think the companies can really uh, support and buy and, and, and sell this genre. So a little small movie, in order to make its money, that's a safer bet. Uh, we did make a very edgy uh, uh, drama called Treachery that is going to get distributed. You can see it. it still falls in the line of the genre, but it's not. It's, it is more of a drama, and um, but it has an edgy feel to it. It's like it's really fucked up. When I <laughs> when I made uh, uh, or when we made uh, the victim, it was made for a very small amount of money, and. Uh, I, I thought at the time, okay, I'm going to make a little small movie, and it's going to be really good, and I'm going to prove to the studios, or to the semi, the mini studios, that I can make a movie, and I'll get more money to make the next big movie, you know. And uh, as it turned out, the movie was very successful, and it got picked up by Anchor Bay, and it got a lot of money in front, and it was very successful. But it turned out that we decided that if we spent less money, and less money, and less and money, money, and keep the quality, because now the cameras are so good, you know? And, uh, uh, you know, you can always find great actors, you know? And it's you also about partnership, you know? Like giving actors a chance, I mean, right? I mean, it, giving them a chance to own a piece of the movie is part of the model. Giving them a chance to, we have an actor that we can't name right now, but it's getting involved in a movie we're doing. But we can, we can, what's his name we can name? Yes. Uh, but he's rewriting the script, and he's, uh, when we announce him, it's a pretty cool guy to have rewriting the script and owning it with you. But, uh, for example, somebody that we just added to Altered Perception, which is um, more of a political thriller, uh, sort of science experiment that we're, that, that we're, we're about to start shooting, uh, is John Cortez from Castle. And then Hidden in the Woods, which we just shot in Texas, which is more along the size of the victim. In, in budget. Um, Which is still like it's still small, but you know, the one 12 days. The five that we do a year are really small. And
we got William Forsythe. William Forsythe, I'd like to know. I don't know who he is, but he's a really, really, really fine actor. And we've got John now, and we're starting to get, what happens is we're starting to get the actors like piece of the movie, say like if it's successful, Here, and you give, you doing, you give you a little tiny bit up front, but if it's successful, you can have 5% of the movie. And, and then their passion, because then they want to create a good movie, you know, and, and, and see what they, they show do. Up on time. <laughs> they show up on time. Yeah, totally. Because they, they own it with us. I just think it's also a cool teamwork kind of effort to feel to these indie movies. And we give something we like, like, like John Ortez. He works on this television series, Castle, which is very, very uh, top ten in the United States. But he has these, you know, he has this dialogue comes down, and he has to say this dialogue every day that somebody else writes, even though it doesn't make any sense sometimes, you know, he can't really change it. He wants to change it. He can't change it, you know. He can, but he's got to fight, you know. And so we say to John, you know, here's our script. You do anything you want with it. Write anything you want. You can create your own character. I did a movie with Zave Jen. It's called The Divide. And he came to us, and the script was okay. But he came to me and Michael Eklund and um, um, Rosanna Arquette and uh, Milo Ventimiglia. Milo Ventimiglia, and basically said, create whatever you want to create here. And we did improvisations and we wrote scenes and we changed our characters. And uh, my character in that movie went from being a antagonist bad guy throughout the entire movie to being a person who is the only person in the movie who everybody has their humanity at the beginning of the movie and they lose their humanity at the end of the movie. In my situation, I had no humanity at the beginning of the movie and I found my humanity at the end of the movie. But I created it myself. I wrote it myself. I wrote the character myself. I created everything that had to do with 9-11. Zave Jens gave us as actors the chance to do that. And as actors, it's really fun. It's, it, that's the way that we like to work and to, to improvise and have time to rehearse and write stuff instead of just, you know, every day the same thing, you know, and having to say people's words that don't make any sense and having to fight, you know, and, uh, you know, uh, we call it like putting lipstick on pigs. <laughs> Because yes. uh, we, this has our uh, website on it for the production company and some of our movies. And, um, you know, you can look up and see all the information, like all of it, and uh, ways to contact us and tell us what you like, what you want to see. So how far can you take that creative process? Because obviously for your movies, you have a very tight budget, a very tight schedule, and you want to get the best out of it, so you get the people to rewrite and create it themselves. How, how far can you take that and not endanger the project as a whole? Well, the thing about uh, our movies is that, you know, when I talk about rewriting a script, changing a character around, we do that before. Yes, we did not have to start shooting. Um, actually, with Xavier, we did it a little bit while we were shooting, actually. We did it a lot while we were shooting. But Xavier's movie was a $4 million movie, and ours was, like, much... You know, we yeah. are the two big ones of ours are under half a million, and then our other ones are hundred thousand dollar movies, eighty thousand dollar movies. But I'm telling you, different vibe. I mean, look way bigger. All of that. We, for example, just shot the girl, which I directed, and it was Michael Bloom, Tia Carrero, and I directed it on the F-65. Hundred thousand dollar movie on the F-65. They shot Oblivion and After Earth on that. If that explains to you what they're usually paying for that camera. So that just makes that movie right there already a half a million dollar movie, but they partnered with us. Sony and Panavision, they saw the vision and they gave us lenses to work with the F-65. They want to take the trailer, if we use it in 4K, and put it in their package and say, look, we're also supporting little tiny horror movies and this and that. And that's the kind of thing that is starting to happen in the community. That, um, you're actually able to shoot a really tiny little movie on this, like, camera you don't even need to be shooting at all. Mm -hmm. uh, that, and that's what I also talk to, 
there's a lot of uh, you know, young kids, students, whether you're a student or not. I mean, but if you want to make movies now, you can make movies. You don't have to. This is what Robert Rodriguez taught me. And, you know, Jim Cameron said, told me about Robert. Uh, he said, like, you know, one of the brilliant things about Robert is that he just, he doesn't understand <laughs> that he can't do something. So he just does it. Yeah. And that's the way it is now with making movies is now there's all, everybody's got a camera. This is uh, the guy that uh, is directing uh, Hidden in the Woods. I saw um, um, at the film festival. What's his name? We saw him at Fantasia, which is where we found the movie. Uh, it's Patricio Valadera. Yeah, Patricio. And, um, so Patricio, I was like judging first time filmmakers, <coughs> right? So I see this movie and I think this is a great filmmaker. He's a great filmmaker. He's from Chile and it's subtitled. And I say to myself, you know what? This is a great film, but nobody in North America is going to see this movie because it's subtitled. And nobody watches subtitles. I mean, I don't even watch subtitles. I mean, you know. Mm -hmm. it, it, you, well, you, got, you, got, you got, have to watch subtitles a lot, right? You can stop, but uh, in America, they don't watch them as much. But he, he came to me, and he had a camera that looked like this camera. Yeah, it looked just like this. And he had it around his neck, you know? And he said, oh, uh, and he was like a fanboy. He said, oh, can I take a picture of you? He had his wife with him, who pr uh, produced the movie with him. He said, can I take a picture of you and, and have his wife take a picture of this and that? I said, yes. And we took pictures and so on and so forth. And so I looked, I saw his movie, and I thought, ah, this is such a, it was such a beautiful movie to, to watch, beautifully shot, you know? I thought, and I said, why did you shoot the movie on? Meaning, like, the red camera, this camera she's talking about, and he said, this, this, you know, <laughs> this camera, you know? So he shot a whole, whole, a whole movie, which I thought looked beautiful and, and really well done on a camera that looked just like this one. I don't know if this one is capable no. of it or not. No. <laughs> and then we but you, here, one we of you probably would have one. And he showed up in the woods for us, uh, which when you start seeing it, uh, I don't know how many of you have seen information and articles and like Dread Central and stuff on it, but if you go to our website, blogbeanproductions.com, you can see all kinds of information on the uh, English remake, and it's just it's a great cast. He's done an incredible job, and um, I think it's, we, we, he wanted to go use the Red Epic. He ended up using the uh, Canon Mark V, with like a very special 200 lens, it looks, it's the most beautiful thing I've ever seen. And we've shot with the red one, we've shot with the scarlet, we've shot with the F65, and this is the most beautiful thing I've ever seen. So we shot with three cannons with these lenses. It's fucking gorgeous, I'm telling you. You see it, <laughs> it's pretty amazing. And but these days, it's like film. if you want to make a movie, you can have a camera that looks like that, and you can be walking through, um, you know, anywhere really with it and uh, it can be in a, in a, in a um, uh, concert hall or you can be in a movie theater or you can be, and nobody's going to walk up and say, do you have a permit, you know, to shoot a uh, film here, you know, they can't tell anymore, you know, it used to be when I, I couldn't make a movie when I was your age, I couldn't make a movie with these big cameras and like 80 <laughs> people around. Now, all you need, and that's what Robert Rodriguez's book is about, you know, Rebel Without a Crew, is just, you pick up a camera, you go shoot, and you, you have a sound person, and that's all you need. And you don't need to do anything else. And that's, uh, you don't need anything else. Other, every, you always find actors. Everybody wants to be an actor. Everybody wants to be a director. You can always find people like that. And so it's very, and then there's, you go on to, uh, your app, your computer, and they, what's the cutting, what's the cutting? Uh, Final Cut Pro. Final Cut Pro, you know, you cut the movie together, you can make movies now, everybody's doing it, they put it up on YouTube. I was, I was, I was at, um, I did a movie, uh, what was the movie I was doing over there, the, the sequel to, um, the sequel to the big, uh, the big, big Scorpion King. Scorpion King. I was doing a movie uh, called Scorpion King. And I was talking to one of the actors in it, and this kid basically 
was co-starring in the movie, much larger role than I had in it. And I just came in and out real quickly. Like I, I was like, you know, in for like four or five days and then out quickly. <laughs> But then you my price and so on and so forth. This kid they had to hang around a while. But he basically he went He played King in a but he uh, went on bad to guy or he went to he went on YouTube and he would do imitations of famous characters from movies. And maybe you might know him from the he's been around for about five years, but he would do like once looked at Cuckoo's Nest, he'd do Jack Nicholson, or he would do uh, Wise Guys from, uh, or he would do, you know, You Can't Handle the Truth, you know, and he would play all those different characters, and, and he, would, he would do an imitation. His imitations were like, he was imitating them, but they were, and he shot it, and he's gotten so much notoriety from that, they started calling him from Hollywood, come out, and you, we, we want to put you in the movies. So, now, with YouTube, I mean, you can shoot a book movie, put it up on YouTube. Who knows? Next thing, you might be at the Academy Awards. Yeah. <laughs> but he plays, a, he, he plays a good guy with a bad son. Very bad son. Uh, you're talking about the, the Scorpion King. He's asking about the Scorpion King, what you would play. Yeah. You play a good guy or bad guy. Yeah, I play, yeah, I play, yeah, I, I, I play a, a king who's got a, a son who wants to play. <laughs> We've got time for two more questions. I, I think uh, Ridley Scott would totally agree with what you guys are saying. He's on YouTube with a camera in his hand. It's a Canon EOS V7, actually, with a very nice, expensive Nikon lens, though. Mm -hmm. And uh, like 200 saying, lenses. Yeah, yeah. Oh, yeah. And he's saying, <laughs> I'm making films, why aren't you? And it used to be, I think, if you can't beat them, join them. But now I think Hollywood knows if we can't join you, we'll beat you. Because People these days out here in this audience are probably going to be making films with this good, quite well, protection value, with microphones as well. <coughs> My question is this. Um, even though we have all that technology now, these people have great ideas, and you've evened it out now, and, and I think that's really great if you're just saying you've evened it out. There's this Hollywood mechanism that anyone can make from it. It's changing fast. Yeah, I mean, how do you think, my that. question is, sorry, how does Hollywood, sorry, sorry how, how do you think Hollywood feels? The guys in the big, Universal Studios, they created United Artists, Chaplin and the rest, because the actors needed more power at one time. Hey, the Are they trying to buy it out? I don't yeah. know how they feel, but I know sometimes they buy those movies, so they must first, like it a little bit. First of all, <laughs> you know? if you look at Hollywood today, they're not making great movies anymore, okay? <laughs> the reason they're not making great movies is because all the studios have been bought by uh, uh, conglomerates that are only interested in making money. They're making a lot of money, and do Terminator 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, Aliens 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, Fast and the Furious 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, says, you know, uh, Johnny Depp 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, <laughs> they don't care about that anymore. So all the good movie making is going to television, you know, and you're getting The Walking Dead and things like that that people like are watching and uh, Kevin Spacey series and so on and so forth. So it's going a lot to television. But there's going to be ABC in this the United States, and you might not understand it very well, but ABC, NBC, CBS, and the Fox Network have been the king of network television in America for 50 years. 10 years from now, they're going to be just like everybody else. And another example is when he was doing The Scorpion King as a universal movie, I was sitting there uh, giving some information to the woman who is the head of Universal <laughs> for that division. And it happened to be on a card, like you guys just got, what one that had him in the woods on it, for whatever reason. Uh, that's the one I had in my purse at the moment. And she said, oh, what's this? And I said, oh, well, we're making movies now. Besides working for you guys and getting hired, you know, we're, we're also making some work. She said, oh my god. We do negative pickups, which means they now are looking for content. She said, we, have, we need more content. content. There's so much going out. Content. Negative pickups? Yeah, content. negative pickup is like they will promise you, like if you make this movie that you're, that we read your script, we like it, you make it, you have um, any of these 10 actors in there, we can promise you that we'll buy it for this, for Universal. They basically say now, like, content is king. Content is king. Now, 
There will always be a place, I believe, for the big studios like Avatar and the big movies like Ridley Scott and Martin Scorsese's movies. And, yeah. and the, I think there will, there will always be a place for those big movies to take your son and go out something and see 3D. And they make these brilliant children's movies now also. So that's also part of the equation that, and see all these studios, they own this, the, 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 uh, the screens also. The screens are all owned by these conglomerates. And so like if you make a movie and you want to show it someplace, there's no place to show it. They don't, they, they don't own the internet. They, they, but there's, but there's a they don't own the internet. That's they right. Don't they the don't own the internet. And they would love to. Right? Yeah, but they, yeah, that's right. <laughs> and there's a very new way of distributing movies theatrically now. And it's what we did with The Victim, and it's what Kevin Smith did with Red State, and it's going to very small theaters or festivals and doing Q&As after, and it's considered a theatrical release. And so sometimes they do a 15 city release and it's just four days in each city, but you get reviewed, or a week in each city, but you get reviewed the same way that those big 20th century Fox movies are getting reviewed. You know, and, and the, the companies that are buying them seem to think that's important for marketing. It seems to be a new thing coming out with VOD on the internet, streaming media, where you can do something called day and date. So it's playing in a theater near you for one week. Yep. It could be a week or a day, and they call it day and date. And all of a sudden, people in their living room can stream it at the same time it's coming out in the theater, and that sounds very exciting. And then they can charge a little more, and they can make their money back. And then when it stops being in the theaters, then it can go down to the normal, you know, whatever the VOD price is that's not day and date with the theater. But it's giving small movies and small, smaller filmmakers a chance to release their movies in the same fashion. And you know, like when I watch television now, I mean, I used to watch, you know, just like a lot of times sports and news. But now you've got like, you know, people that are rebuilding cars. You've got like six shows on people who are making cakes and different ways of making cakes. <laughs> you know, you've got shows on guys who are shooting crocodiles and Kevin Crocodiles, you've got the, you know, the History the Channel, <laughs> the History Channel, you've got the, the shows about jail and like how many, you Do you know, guys have Duck Dynasty? Duck Dynasty? You don't have Duck Dynasty? Oh I my mean, god. I mean, the, 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 the choices are going from like 100 to 100,000 within 10 years of what you want to watch. And pretty soon, your television is going to be a big computer screen, and you're going to have a thing like this, and if you want to watch uh, season two, the third show from The Twilight Zone, you press a button, and you'll have it up there. Or if you want to watch your own third movie. season, your own movie, <laughs> The Walking Dead, uh, you know, whatever, that's the way it's going to be. Ladies and gentlemen,